played second team games. Obviously in the first three or four years, uh, we carried the rest of the counties on our shoulder. Um, it was a big burden for us. Uh, and in those days, obviously each team had two excellent overseas fast bowlers and uh, we were in a transaction because you had our overseas players, people like Kenai and uh, Jamesons and David Browns all retiring at the same time. So we were going through this period of change. Uh, we still had some of the old players left and the new players coming in. So it took us a good five, six years before we started to go up the table. Uh, and it was with people like Bob Cotton, which took over, and then we had additional players like Dermot, one or two others come through. And change of attitude, we changed our fortunes and, and we, we took off probably from 1987 onwards. Yes, because then, then you joined in 1988, Dermot, and in 89 you got the first trophy in the one day final in the Nat West, uh, which is remembered mostly for the fact that Neil Smith in the dark hit the six off the last over. But I think a lot of people tend to think of the stand you had in 93, but you were at the wicket together in 89 at the Nat West final against Middlesex. We were. Uh, and one of you got run out. Um, and, it wasn't and me. Who was it? <laughs> it was his fault. I I'm taking the microphone. Asif hit it to mid wicket and said, Yes, no. So I come, you know, part the way down and didn't get back and, and was run out. But it's probably, it probably a good thing because I don't think I'd have waxed it onto the covers for six like Neil Smith did. So, uh, yeah, as if you were still there at the Can end. Can I say sorry to you? Um, oh, I think I forget. I apologise now. No, it's all right, man. Well, then look right. on his face as he walked off. You probably did the right thing not speaking to him. But, uh, yeah. Now, we, we always got on okay, yeah. myself and Asif, and, you know. As, yeah. uh, as players. Can I just say though, before we talk, it's really, it is wonderful to come back to Edgeworth. I just want to say hi to all, all the members and people that are here still, still supporting the Bears. Once, once a bear, always a bear. So, uh, you know, whether, whether the side wins or loses, as long as the guys are out there absolutely giving their all and doing their best, that's, you know, all you can do as a cricketer. So please, you know, keep supporting them with the, the love uh, that, you, that you show as, uh, as the Birmingham public to them because that's what they need. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's good words. And 1993, you took over as the captain, um, taken over from Andy Lloyd, who sort of, again, had got the ball moving. He decided to get to Warwickshire, again, getting back towards building a good side. And, and you took over then as captain, uh, just ahead of that fantastic year of 1994. It, uh, yep. <laughs> did you... Did you could you see at that stage that the potential was so great for the Warwickshire side? Uh, players have got the talent. Every player has a unique skill set. And your job as a, as a captain and the coach's job is to, uh, to get the best out of that, those players' unique skill sets. But you know, the first thing I did when I became captain was try and create a, a different environment and a different culture. Um, before that, as a, as a young player, you know, you had, you had to come along and knock on the on the dressing room door of the of the first team if you were uncapped and wait for somebody to say come in and so you weren't felt you weren't made to feel like you were equal. Um, so you know, I I got rid of the of the feeling of senior and junior and uncapped and capped and made us everybody equal and you're just as important if you're a young player your first year on the staff. It could be that that young player he might not have the, all the experience. But he might just have a little gem of an idea that that he shares that actually helps you, you know, helps you get a wicket out on the field. And you want an environment where that, those players are are comfortable and encouraged to share their ideas. So you know, you want all players really to be captaining a side in their mind. You want all players to be thinking like winners and behaving like leaders. But you've got to you've got to have an environment of no blame and no moaning and a hundred percent encouragement between player and player. So I think, you know, we just, we got an environment rolling that was, that was I believe you play at your best when you're relaxed, you're confident and you enjoy it. So you've got to, you've got to, you know, be in a positive place when you turn up, you go into that dressing room door. I always had a, a check on my feelings and go, right, I'm now gonna walk into the dressing room and I'm gonna affect everybody in that dressing room with my energy. 
So I'm going to walk, I'm going to open that room, I'm going to put a smile on my face, I'm going to be upbeat and go, morning, hi everybody, hi, hi, how are you? And I'll just be happy and positive. And you do that every day. Whether you're winning or losing, it's the right thing to do. And it rubs off on people. And they, they go, oh, hi, and, every, and they're suddenly they're happy. And you end up with a happy, jolly place where guys out on the field, uh, you know, are working really hard, they're busting a gut. But, you know, it's about getting that environment right. And you can't have, you can't have blame and, and moaning. You've got to have 100% encouragement between player to player. But as a captain, or as the coach, we're the only ones that should be permitted that if we want to pull a player aside and have a harsh word with him. And I would say in my, my time as captain, the only player that I'm motivated through intimidation um, and it's questionable whether, you know, we don't think, ang we don't think anger's a good, good emotion to feel. You know, if you get a bad decision and you're angry, once you come off, it's happened. It's happened. There's no point being angry and frustrated and staying on that negative side. You know, you've got to accept it, the decision's been done, and you've got to try and be calm. That's a far better way to be. However, certain players, and Paul Smith, Paul Smith was the only player that I tried to motivate through intimidation. I, I felt he bowled better when he was angry. So I would go up to him and say, you're bowling like, you're, you're bowling rubbish, Smithy. And I'd, instead of throwing the ball to him, I'd throw it on the floor and make him pick it up. And I'd say, you, you don't deserve me to throw the ball. I'd just wind him up and get him angry. And he, you know, he had a bit of pain in his knee, but if you got him angry, he actually ran in a bowl much faster. So he was the only player that I used that theory with. All the other ones, it was about, you know, encouragement. And how did you get on with Brian Lara then in the team? <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> um, Brian was the best cricketer, the best batsman I ever, I ever saw. You know, watching him bat, he was amazing. He just had so much talent. But um, I don't think Brian, to be honest, accepted that. That really, as as a captain of a side, you know, you, you're the boss of, of the players don't you? You're their boss on the field. You're in charge of, of the tactics, you're in charge of, of uh, if you like, what, I'm trying to think of the word here, discipline, players' discipline. Um, and, I, and Brian, you know, he didn't really, I, th I felt, show me um, that respect necessarily on the field with, with me as the captain. If I was doing things tactically, you know, he'd, he would be a bit negative and, and say things. So, you know, we didn't see eye to eye on, on a few things. Um, but, you know, fortunately, I think there was still very much respect there for each other as cricketers. So, you know, we kept the ball rolling, we kept the train on the tracks that year. We won three trophies out of four, which was an amazing season. The following year, we didn't have Brian, and we had Alan Donald back, and we, we won two out of the four. Um, and for me, as a, as, a, as a captain, that was mu a much easier year for me to, you know, Alan Donald was way easier to captain than, than Brian, but he was a, definitely an absolute superstar cricketer that not only scored his runs so quickly, but allowed us to bowl sides out twice. You know, I think Glenn Turner of Worcester one year scored more runs than any cricketer in the country, and Worcester finished bottom of the table, because you still got to take 20 wickets. So, you know, we weren't Lara Shire. We didn't win the championship because of Brian Lara. We won it because of, of the squad and the 11 players that took the field and the, and the culture that we were trying to create. So, just talking on the, uh, and perhaps Asif has been part of that squad as well, that they probably didn't, as individuals, get the recognition whilst it worked very well. There was always this thing that they, a lot of them didn't get on to play at international level. I never quite took that next step, and yet as a team, the record probably, it's going to be difficult to see how it will be surpassed in, what, in terms of what happened in 94. It was a team that got together over a number of years, and we all grew up together. We knew what the ability of the other player was. Obviously with Bob Wilmer and Dermot coming in and putting the icing on the cake and changing people's attitudes and positiveness in the game of cricket that we played, we suddenly developed. There was no game that we turned up for thinking that we were ever going to lose. I think there were two or three games that we were in losing positions and we turned them around and actually won those games. I think there was a couple in the Sunday League. There was one, I think against Worcester, which we turned around from them needing seven to win with four overs to go and we tied the game. 
you know, those are the kind of things that was installed in the team and, and the belief started to come through, no matter what game of cricket we played, that we could not be beaten as a team. And that was, you know, it's difficult for any team to combat against. Um, we, we had a saying that, um, you know, every ball is an event. You just got to be in the right head, the right place in your head, every single ball of the season. Just do your best every single ball. Doesn't matter whether you win or lose. As long as you've absolutely given your all, you know, at the end of the day, you can look in the mirror, you can hold your head up high and say, I was a good bloke. I encouraged my teammates. I did my best. And winning and losing takes care of itself. When it comes to terms of, of getting picked for higher honours of playing for England, that's not you know, what it's about playing for Warwickshire. You just got to, you know, worry about the day. You know, you, you're, not, you're not playing for Warwickshire to, to get picked for England. You're playing for Warwickshire to win that day, to win the next ball. And it's not, you know, you, if you choose to play cricket, you got to accept that things aren't in your hand. Winning matches isn't always in your hand. It can be down to, to the umpires or how well the opposition play. So if you don't get picked, you don't get picked for, for higher honours. You know, you've just got to work on, on having acceptance. That decision has been made. You know, there's no point remaining frustrated. It's out of your control. It's a bit like if you're made 12th man. You think you should be picked, but you get a tap on the shoulder, you're 12th man today. If you sit there frustrated and angry and feeling sorry for yourself, that's, that is no good. That's not what it's about being a bear. You've got to go, right, okay, I'm going to choose to be acceptant of the decision. I'm going to feel proud of myself for choosing to be accepting. And you know what? I'm going to do the best job ever as 12th man. I'm going to put a smile on my face. I'm going to buzz around the dressing room. I'm going to encourage everybody. I'm going to run the gloves out to the batsman quickly. That's what it's, that, that's what it's about. So emotionally, I think that's what you need to do as a cricketer, is set yourself emotional goals. Not, not I want to play for England You know, by the end of the season. I want to score a 1,000 runs. Or, it's about actually making sure you're in the right emotional state that actually it's good for you, but it rubs off on, on all your teammates as well. And if you get that going in, a, in, a, in business or in, in cricket, it can be a really powerful, powerful weapon, having that. So, and you've got to be like that as a captain or as a coach or as a management group. You have to be like that whether you win or lose. It's still the same message whether you've lost a game it's about being upbeat and positive and making sure the next day when you come in, you know, you're, you're thinking like a winner and behaving like a leader. The influence of, um, of Bob Warner on the side has uh, been lots written about that. Do you like to uh, say it in way that it affected your game at all, Dianasa? He had a lot of calming effect on people. You know, he was an easy guy to get on with. Not a lot would faze him. Uh, he'd encourage with Dermot, he encouraged people to play their natural games, not worry about getting out. So again, it was all positive thinking rather than any kind of negative thinking. So when you go out to bat as a batsman with a positive frame of mind and having a plan in my head to execute, if I didn't execute it well, he would come back and say, thinking was right, execution was wrong. Dermot as well. So you had the confidence to go out and play knowing that you've got people behind you who are also thinking the same way that you are. So your performances get better because you're thinking positively and you're not worried about failure. One of the things that I found over my stretch of 15 years with Warwickshire, in the first half of my career, I had fear of failure. In the second half of my career, there was no fear of failure. So if you analyze my performances in the first half to the second half, I think you'll find there'll be a big difference in the number of runs and the number of games I won for Warwickshire. Sorry. It's a really, no, I'm just saying, it's a really good point because, you know, fear, fear is, is a, a negative emotion, but it's a natural thing to have. You have a bit of anxiety, you know, and that's brought on by a bit of fear, that nervousness, because something's happening which you feel is a pressure environment. Your waves are going to bat, the run rate is going up from five and over to seven and over, you know, the game's on the line and you start to feel what we call pressure, right? Now, pressure is just a word, right? All that feeling is of pressure, a far better word to use is challenge. All that feeling is, it means in your life there's a challenge occurring, okay? Now, do you want to be something, somebody who fears the challenge or relishes the challenge? So the opposite emotion 
So fear would be confidence. So what you've got to do is recognize, oh, I'm feeling a bit of fear, feeling a bit nervous. That means there's a challenge happening. Now, I want to be someone that relishes that challenge. So you sit there playing a movie of yourself winning the game, bringing the game home, bowling the last over when they need 10, and nailing six Yorkers and we win. That's how you deal with that pressure by actually having you know, positive visualization, positive images in your head. And that's, uh, you know, that is a real key to coping. There's, there's a lot of good cricketers and they practice really, really hard and they, they just get better at batting at practice. They don't actually get better at batting in matches because when the match comes along, they're in a completely different mental state than they are at practice. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they need to be doing the work on their mental state. So they need to be doing that work where Muhammad Ali, he said publicly to everybody at the start of a press conference, I am the greatest, I am the greatest. He said it all the time, I am the greatest. And his conscious brain was programming his subconscious that he is the greatest. So as a cricketer, every Warwickshire player could decide tomorrow in their mind that they are the best player in the country and tell their subconscious that, I'm fantastic, I'm great. And that's, you know, that's the area of the game which is a bit underdone. It's still questionable, can you coach confidence? Can you coach belief? But I believe you can, and it's down to players to do positive visualizations in their head, you know? And, and that way you perhaps are gonna cope better when a challenge comes along and not, I've, I've seen guys, that, as I say, practice 24 seven, have a really good work ethic, but when the match day comes along, they don't, they, they have that fear. While uh, there's other guys, two guys I work with in India, Yuvraj Singh and Jesse Ryder in the IPL, those two actually practice the least of the, of the batsmen. They hit the, the fewer amount of balls, but they were the best players because they, on match day, they had the most big match, the, best, the most belief, the most big match temperament, and they were like, Dale Stane's bowling at me today, it's a good wicket, I'm gonna go out there and smash him. When they said it, they played a little movie of themselves doing it, you know? So that's about, that's one of the keys to having, you know, to having belief is that positive reinforcement in your mental state all the time that you are good enough. So the players all the time should be succeeding in their thoughts, programming their subconscious that they are successful, that they are fantastic players, that they, you know, that they are the best player in the country in, in their minds. And that, that will help them deal with, with pressure situations. Well, that certainly came through in the 94, 95 seasons, and the, uh, the results of the trophies are evidence of that fact. We're running out of time. we have games due to restart in uh, 10 minutes. Would we have time for uh, some questions for, for Dermot or for Anthony from the floor? Alan. You still got your guitar? Yeah, I still, I still have a guitar. I still play a, play a little bit of guitar at times to, yeah, to amuse myself, but don't, don't play as much as I perhaps should. Because when I do play it, and I'm in that moment of just, it's me and the guitar and, and nothing else in the world matters, um, that's a nice sort of place to escape to. There's, I, I, I've got a saying that, and I think it's quite relevant in life as well as cricket, that you know, live in the past, you're depressed, live in the future, you're stressed. What you've got to try and do is be very mindful and live in the moment. So the moment's that it's just me and the guitar, you know, I'm forgetting the fact that I'm getting old or, you know, oh. My kids are living in a different city to me and, and all the, the stresses that, that come along with life. So, yes. Question at the front? Yeah. If an opportunity ever came up to coach in England for a county, would you take consider it? Um, so just, I, just, I, the question was, if the opportunity ever came up to coach in England, would Dermot take it? Um, I don't want to take anybody's job, <laughs> right? I want to make that absolutely clear um, at the moment. At the moment, I, got a, I coach out in Australia. And I do that for eight months, from the beginning of August to the end of March. Um, but I'm absolutely open to, uh, to you know, to, to come somewhere for a few weeks. And whether it, you know, and, and my first choice obviously would be to, and yeah, you know, Ash, Ash knows that, and you know, here at the club, he knows if he ever wants me, and I'm available to come over and, and do a few weeks or whatever, I would, I would love it. I've, I've spoken to another couple of counties about that possibility for, for next season. Um, I still think I've, you know, I have a decent cricket brain. I have some worth. The club I coach in Australia just won 
We just won the Premiership. Um, so, you know, I think if there was a county out there that thought, let's get him out in for a month pre-season, let's have that his energy, you know, his, uh, injection of his energy and his enthusiasm and, and have his eyes, um, hopefully there's a county out there that, you know, that I might get a bit of, a little bit of work, work with, because I've got, I do have four months of that always available, um, sort of April to, to August. Do we have any other questions? Right, oh, yes, oh, one. He wants another pint. No, no. <laughs> get me a drink, mate. I'm not going to my Pardon? I did a day with the players yesterday. I did a presentation on thinking like a winner Thank yesterday. Work today. the players. <laughs> no. No, but what you know, it was it was fun to do. You know, it was fun to do. Hopefully, the players found it worthwhile. Um, so, you know, I've, I've done a day here with with you know with the Bears, um, which was yesterday, and who knows what who knows what will happen you know in the future. But you know, what you've got to do at the moment is you know support support the management, support the players that, that are out there. There's no there's no quick fix. There's no oh you know let's let's have a magic wand. But you know I did I did do a presentation that I do on on thinking like a winner, which is uh, what I presented to the boys yesterday. So any other questions? I've got just one thing. Do you still do your uh, Imran Khan? Impression. No, I don't do any more Imran Khan impressions because he didn't think I was a very good player. I can remember hearing that many times. In fact, the nicest Imran Khan ever was to me was after the 92 World Cup final where Pakistan had just beaten England and we were in the changing room afterwards. And as I said, it was the nicest he ever was to me. We we're sitting there and he said, Dermot, I must say, I want to say to you, you know, well done. You've done so well to get this far in the game for a man of your limited talent. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that point, and on that note, we will say to both Asif Din and to Dermot Reed, a very good thank you. Thanks very much. Love to be back.